Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. It was late October 1685 when the fleet of Lorho de Graff and Michel de Grimaud quit Campeche. They gathered together at Ilam Muerjes, just off the coast of modern-day Cancun, to divide their plunder. For everyone, it was a disappointing haul. The raid on Campeche had been largely a waste of time. They'd hardly taken anything of real value, mostly just some logwood. There was a tension between the crews, and they chose to go their separate ways. It would prove to be the last time that some of these pirates would ever see each other. Lorho de Graff, in his ship Fortune, set sail for Petit Guave alongside Pierre Bote in Nuestra Señora de Regla and three other sloops. Only a few days north from Ilam Muerjes they were spotted by a contingent of the Armada de Barlavento. Admiral Andres de Ocoa Izarate was elderly. He had been in command of ships that had chased after Francois Lolonet and Henry Morgan twenty years earlier. Still, he ordered the Armada to give chase. The buccaneers ran. They tacked north-northwest, letting the winds carry them into the Gulf of Mexico. On September 11, 1685, the Regla and one of the sloops in the fleet fell astern. They were intercepted by the Spanish, and the Armada was forced to concentrate on their prisoners, giving de Graff a momentary chance at escape. And he grasped at that chance, but come morning the Armada was once again giving chase. The royal frigate Nuestra Señora del Jojón spotted the fortune that afternoon. She sent the smaller and faster ship, Jesus, Mary y José, to intercept de Graff. Then word was sent to the admiral, and the entire armada set a course to capture de Graff and their two remaining sloops. They caught up to the pirates on September 13 at Alacran Reef. There was no sign when they arrived of the Jesus, Maria y José. Evidently she'd been lost. Admiral Zarate sailed the flagship Santo Cristo de Burgos, and the vice-admiral, Antonio de Astina, sailed the Nuestra Señora de la Concepción. Both were large, both were heavily armed Spanish warships. Usually, these were the sort of ships that couldn't hope to catch a privateer vessel, but right now they had the advantage. De Graff's ship was laden with cargo. He had that logwood alongside sugar and indigo, the sort of heavy, cumbersome cargo that pirates preferred not to carry if they could help it. The Spanish vessels had the advantage of the wind as well, and they were able to come upon fortune from two sides. As the Santo Cristo and the Concepcion neared de Graff's position, he ordered all of that cargo dumped overboard. Anything that wasn't essential was tossed into the ocean. He was trying, desperately, to catch the wind. He should have been able to outrun those lumbering, hulking vessels, but, as night fell... They closed in. De Graff and the crew spent a sleepless night on board the Fortune. When dawn arrived on September 14, the Spanish opened fire. They had between them the Fortune in their crossfire, and they sent barrage after barrage of heavy shot against her. The three ships danced about one another, trying to gain the advantage. They traded fire again and again throughout most of the day. Over 3,000 rounds of shot were fired by the two Spanish vessels alone, and we don't have a record of how much de Graff shot off. A lesser commander, who was trapped and outgunned by two heavy Spanish galleons, would probably have surrendered here. But not Lorho de Graff. He fired back on them. He used both his heavy guns and musket volleys all throughout the day. He was manning both sides of the vessel as well, and oftentimes when the Spanish pressed to their attack, he would have crew fighting simultaneously on both sides. Many of those Spanish volleys hit home on the fortune, but de Graff and his helmsmen managed to keep the fortune moving and just barely evaded the worst of the fire. Their hull stayed seaworthy, if only barely, and all of the masts still stood. The firefight was loud and feverish. Men on board were burned and mangled. When a ball hit their mark, sailors died, or at least lost limbs. The air would have been full of smoke and the smell of blood and gunpowder. It would also be full of screams, but most of the men that were alive would be unable to hear them over the roar of cannon and the ringing in their own ears. All day this fight lasted. But as the daylight faded, so did the Spanish admiral. Andres de Ocoa Izarate was very old, and this battle proved to be too much for him. 
He grew delirious and weak. There was a lull in the fighting as the last rites were administered to the Admiral. Command was transferred over to Vice Admiral Astina. Lorho de Graff, though, took advantage of that lull. He was in a tight spot right here and knew it was time to roll the dice. He ordered all of the guns dumped overboard, both their cheap iron guns as well as their expensive fine brass guns. Then they dumped all of the shot and powder, anything that wasn't needed to load their personal muskets. This was the last of their heavy cargo on board, but it was also their only hope of defending themselves should it fall to fighting again. I wonder if de Graff kept one cask of gunpowder to light a flame and burn his men, himself, and the fortune, rather than be taken. While all of their guns sunk to the sea floor, though, the fortune finally caught a favorable wind. They were able to sail away from the battle. While the fortune and one of the other sloops was able to get away, the loss of Captain Boat and Nuestra Señora de Regla and the other sloop, that meant two hundred men had been captured by the Spanish. That included pirates that made their home all over the West Indies, from Port Royal to Petit Guave to the Mosquito Coast to the Laguna de Terminos. But 120 of the men captured all hailed from that new French colony on the coast of the Gulf of Mexico, the one founded by René Robert Sieur de la Salle. What Lorho de Graff didn't know, perhaps we might say what he didn't expect, is that an inquisition had been called in the Spanish New World. Now, there was a permanent office of inquisition in Cartagena, but they were there mostly to deal with witches and heretics and the like. The inquisition in question here had been called specifically to deal with the scourge of the Corsarios Luteranos. The inquisitors were sent from old Spain to root out the corruption in the Spanish Empire, the corruption that allowed corsairs to flourish in their lands, then they were to use their interrogative techniques to expose, infiltrate, and destroy the Corsair menace. This is episode 56, Armageddon. Lorho de Graff sailed for home after the battle at Alacron Reef, but he would have stopped in Port Royal to rest and resupply before heading on to Petit Guave. Port Royal wasn't the most welcoming harbor for buccaneers right now, but de Graff was a privateer in good standing with a French commission, and more to the point, Governor Lynch had promised him a welcome in Port Royal months ago. By late 1685, though, the governor, Lynch, was dead. He'd passed away a few months earlier, but it's entirely possible that de Graff hadn't heard the news. He'd been out at sea and then cooped up in Campeche for many months. Still, the lieutenant governor, Hinder Molesworth, was acting governor, and he was an old friend of Lynch's that would have honored his wishes towards the Dutchman. But that wasn't a certainty. Things in Jamaica were in a state of uncertainty. See, not only the governor had died. Back in England, King Charles II was dead. Now, rest assured here, we're going to look at the death of King Charles and everything that that means in great detail. But today we're just going to brush on by that. It would have probably only been of some passing interest to Lorho de Graff. He was probably personally more concerned about the new governor that was set to arrive in Port Royal and what he might think about French privateers. The new governor was going to be Christopher Monk, Duke of Albemarle. Now, you might remember him as a roguish young man in the streets of London that befriended Henry Morgan back in 1671, but by this point he was an illustrious lord, and he had an impressive list of titles. He was a minister of parliament, and then he joined the peerage in the House of Lords. He was a knight of the garter, he was a gentleman of the bedchamber, he was a privy councillor, he was lord of Boland, and the list just goes on and on, and none of that even includes his military honors. But de Graff and his companions would have been more concerned about what the duke's policy would be concerning the privateers. If the actions of Molesworth over the past few months were any indication, well, they would probably be tough but fair. See, it was Molesworth that had had to deal with the fallout from Cartagena and was currently dealing with the fallout from Campeche. 
He was also the governor who had to deal with the resumption of hostilities between France and Spain, and it was Molesworth that ordered the HMS Ruby to sail for Petit Guave to arrest Jan Willems, which was unsuccessful, and he also ordered the Ruby to sail for the Isla de Pinos to arrest Joseph Bannister, which had also been unsuccessful. But in the West Indies, the English were still doing their job. They were fighting piracy anywhere it was to be found. For example, Jean Hamelin had returned from Africa aboard La Trompousse. He had a hold full of slaves and ivory, which he meant to sell off in the West Indies. Now, he'd nearly been killed when those slaves on board revolted, but he'd quashed that with a singular brutality. Hamlin had sailed for St. Thomas, the Dutch colony, where he and Governor Adolf Esmet had a certain understanding. He'd fired off their private signal with the guns and was admitted into the harbor. Esmet unloaded all of his slaves and brought them into the fortress for safekeeping. But two days later, the HMS Francis, under Captain Charles Carlyle, arrived there in St. Thomas, having word that Hamlin was back. He saw La Trompousse there in the harbor, and when he contacted Esmet, he demanded he hand Jean Hamlin over. Esmet declined, however. He even denied that the ship was La Trompousse. It was flying Danish colors, see? It wasn't a privateer vessel at all, but a royal naval ship. Everybody involved knew that that was a lie, but there was very little that an English captain could say to a Danish governor but there was one thing he could do. In the night, Captain Carlyle sent two boats over to La Trompousse. They boarded the pirate ship and attacked her. The crew jumped overboard and fled, including Hamlin, but the English then set fire to La Trompousse. Eventually, that caught the magazine ablaze, and La Trompousse exploded. Now, Hamlin's career wasn't quite over. He would harass Spanish shipping around Brazil and capture a few other ships here and there. But his days of being a terror in the West Indies, well, they were over. Eventually, he would be killed, and eventually Adolf Esmet would be arrested. What's notable here is that England was diligently hunting for pirates and trying to curb piracy wherever it could be found, while France and the Netherlands, on the other hand, were, if anything, they were encouraging it. Now, Spain would eventually turn to an armada of privateers, who we'll meet a little bit later today. But England was the grown-up in the room. They had royal naval vessels patrolling, doing their job. Perhaps there was an element of atonement here. The English famously employed some of the worst privateers of the age, so maybe they were trying to make up for that. Or it could have been an attempt to appear tough on piracy, a half-hearted attempt. A French report out of Martinique in 1685 stated that the pirates would still, quote, go to buy their weapons, nautical equipment, and munitions in Jamaica, where they bring absolutely all the money they make, which considerably prejudices the colony. End quote. Now, on the one hand, that's an accusation against the English, but doesn't it also sound just a little bit jealous and passive-aggressive? It points out that England is reaping all of the profits from this privateering that really rightly belonged to France. All that would have been shared with Lorho de Graff and his crew while they enjoyed a few rounds with their friends in Port Royal. Jean Hamlin, what the English were up to, the new governor. All of that was important news. It was the sort of thing that any decent buccaneer had to keep abreast of. But the real gossip in town was of Henry Morgan. You see, a book had just been published, sort of a juicy tell-all memoir, a behind-the-scenes look, maybe, at some of the excesses and extremes of the Buccaneer Admiral. Naturally, I'm talking about the Buccaneers of America by Alexandra Olivier Exquimelin. I can only imagine how fascinating that book must have been to these Buccaneers in the 1680s, None of them had been there back in the 1660s. Few of them knew of Morgan as anything more than a prominent Jamaican politician. Now, most of them had heard that he used to sail with the Brethren, but they'd never known him as the commander he had once been. 
So I like to imagine that there were entire crews, maybe taverns filled with buccaneers, all gathered together, and whoever was literate among them would read to them from the book what amounted to, well, it was a history of the buccaneers. It was the story of their past, from the very first French boucanier to Pierre Le Grand, and then their turn towards piracy. Exquamelon had compiled that manuscript after he returned to Europe and settled in Amsterdam. It had been published first a few years earlier, in 1678, as De Amerikinsch Sea Rovers, the American Sea Rovers. It was immediately successful there on the continent. It was part pirate adventure story and part travel log and part nature journal. The descriptions of exotic foods and alien wildlife and savage Indians would have transported the European reader to the West Indies. The stories of the buccaneers, which were part barbarism and part heroism, would have enraptured the European reader. It flew off the shelves of local bookshops. It was so popular that printers couldn't keep up with the demand. Now, contrary to the later notion of pirates as being adventure tales for boys, the success of the Buccaneers of America was due mostly to women. They drove the demand for the book. Middle-class European women were mostly literate, and they had both the money and the time to buy and read books. Even today, women are still the driving demographic in publishing, and it was arguably even more the case in the 1680s. In a time when reading anything that wasn't current events or reports from your business seemed like frivolities that any self-respecting man wouldn't subject himself to. But there also may have been an element of romance that drove women to read the Buccaneers of America. If all of the men around you were puffed up, tightly knit, proper gentlemen, then those dashing rogues presented in Exquimelin's work may have seemed attractive. And then there was the allure of freedom, that the book represented, of an escape from the regimented, polite life of 1680s Europe. That, I imagine, also would have been very attractive. Now, the book didn't go into the gory details of yellow fever and syphilis and cutting off limbs, which, as a surgeon, Exquimelin certainly saw, but talk like that, of course, didn't sell books. Exquimelin would have received royalties for the fantastic sales of the book, but only from the Dutch edition. Now, not to worry, he became a practicing surgeon and a member of the Surgeons Guild there in Amsterdam, so he was doing fine. But there were many other translations from which he received no money. Immediately, the book was translated into German, and then into Spanish. Now, the German translation was accurate to the Dutch edition, but that Spanish edition could... Well, it really shouldn't even be called a translation. It was more of a reimagining. The buccaneers, which were already villainous, well, they became devils in the Spanish edition. They were the most ungodly, evil sort of caricatures. Granted, if you were Spanish and you were living in Grenada or Maracaibo or Campeche or Panama, well, how would you see the men who invaded your home and tortured and pillaged and murdered and burned and stole everything they could carry away. Devils might not be too far off the mark. That Spanish edition, though, was what was translated into English rather than the original Dutch edition. It was that copy in 1684 that reached the desk of Sir Henry Morgan in Jamaica. It was among the first copies of the Buccaneers of America to make it to the New World, in fact, Morgan's nephew, who was living in London, had to send him a copy. That set off a firestorm of sales in the West Indies. When word got out, everyone wanted to read about the Buccaneers of 15 years ago. Some of the earliest colonial printers, actually, in the New World, both in the North American colonies as well as the West Indies, actually cut their teeth on the Buccaneers of America. But Morgan was furious over the details that were in the book. Most of them he considered lies. He contacted his lawyer, John Green, there in London, who got in touch with the publishers of the book, Thomas Malthus and William Crook. Green informed the publishers that Morgan would be bringing a libel suit against them. Now, Crook settled immediately 
he issued a public apology and saw to it that all further editions of the Buccaneers of America would have a preface. It would state that Exquimelin's account, which, remember, this was actually an inaccurate Spanish translation, was false and misleading. It would also paint Sir Henry Morgan as an English hero. Malthus, though, was not willing to settle. He wanted his day in court. In his affidavit from that court hearing, Morgan stated that he had, quote, against evil deeds, piracies, and robberies, the greatest abhorrence and distrust, end quote. And he goes on that, quote, for the kind of men called buccaneers, he always had and still has hatred, end quote. Malthus lost the case. He was ordered by the court to issue his own apology. He was ordered also to publish the book with that apologetic foreword. But then he had to pay Henry Morgan 200 pounds. This is actually something of an important legal case in the history of English and, eventually, American law. It set a precedent in being the first libel case in which damages were paid in cash. It was also to prove the last victory of Henry Morgan. All the talk in Port Royal would have been about the contents of the Buccaneers of America and the legal fallout from the Buccaneers of America. Lorho de Graff probably would have picked up a copy or two. He was a captain known to bring along violins and trumpets on his voyages to entertain his men, and that sort of diversion, the sort that the Buccaneers of America might offer, would be just the thing after a less than successful raid. But then de Graff sailed home to Petit Guave. When he arrived, he learned that his old companion, Mikhail Andrezun, was already there, and de Graff learned that he'd just missed Michel de Grammont. In a letter to the Spanish governor of Santo Domingo, dated January 8, 1686, French governor Pierre-Paul Terrain de Cousset of Saint-Dominique wrote, quote, Having learned that the one named Michel was anchored seven leagues from Petit Guave with a ship of thirty-six guns and one hundred and fifty men, I went there myself with a king's frigate to disarm them, which they did. After which, having learned they wished to carry off said frigate to become pirates, I had them arrested and confiscated the said frigate, prohibiting any of them from exiting to go privateering under penalty of a corporeal punishment and confiscation of their goods. End quote. It's unclear exactly who de Cusset is referring to here. Both Chevalier Michel de Grammont and Michel Andrezun arrived in Petit Guave at the same time. They were, you know, sailing together. And actually, this letter might be responsible for a historical misunderstanding of Grammont's given name. Now, I've chosen to call him Michel, which is his accepted given name these days, but older histories are less cohesive on the matter of his name. In a letter from a French governor, they would have called anyone named Michael or Mikhail Michel that would have been translated either into English as Michael or kept as the original French Michel. But older histories sometimes call Chevalier de Grammont either Francois or Nicholas. Now, you might notice that both of those names are names shared with other prominent buccaneers men who sailed in the 1680s and oftentimes sailed alongside one another. And the letters of the day between governors, which we get most of this information from, well, they aren't always clear or even correct in who they're talking about. When they call Grimaud Nicholas, it might very well be because he was sailing aboard the St. Nicholas, which formerly had belonged to Nicholas von Horn. So they might not even know they were talking about Michel de Grammont. A Spanish officer or an English sea captain might actually think it was Nicholas von Horn. That's the sort of rabbit hole that can lead you to wonder if Michel de Grammont ever existed. What if it was just a series of miscommunications? Now, it's not. Michel de Grammont did exist. But the details of his life, even details as big as his name, have to be taken with a grain of salt, just as they do with all pirates. But it appears that it was actually Mikhail Andrezun that was arrested there in Petit Guave, and then he was released and chose to retire. He settled down somewhere and disappears from the record. He was one of the most feared pirates of his age. He was written about in furious and contemptible scrawl from every corner of the West Indies, and 
and then he was released and, well, virtually never heard from again. Now, De Cusse claimed his release and his agreeing to retire from privateering as a victory against the pirates, but the Spanish governor from Santo Domingo was unconvinced. He noted this when he wrote back, quote, Those with whom you should make this demonstration are Captain Grammont and Lorencio, who are the ones who most infest these seas and lands of the king, my lord. End quote. And Governor de Cusset did leave out what exactly happened to Michel de Grammont and Lorencio, as it happens. As for Lorencio, he probably met up with André Zun there on Saint-Dominique and discussed their next move. At least, we know that de Graff used the profits from his last several excursions to purchase a little piece of land. Now, we don't know if he wrote his wife and invited her to come live with him on Saint-Dominique. Her name was Francesca Petronia de Guzman. She'd been living in the Canary Islands, and the last record we have of her is in that letter written from the Canaries imploring de Graff to take that Spanish pardon and to move with her to Havana after the raid on Cartagena. Now, obviously that didn't happen, but if you'll remember, I chose to refer to de Graff's former flagship as Francesca, despite the official Spanish name Princesa. I did so because it appears that de Graff was making a statement when he called his ship, officially named Princess, after his wife. Now, it's entirely possible that de Graff actually did already own property. He possibly bought some after the raid on Cartagena sometime in 1684, shortly after his wife wrote him that letter. If he did so, we can assume that he did write his wife and asked her to come live with him there. Now, we don't know that he did. I don't have any records to support it, but I'm going to make that assumption here. He spent months on San Dominique after Cartagena, so it stands to reason that, as he would eventually own property, he spent those months settling down with his wife. Now, we know that at some point he became the owner of 100 slaves. He may have bought them, but he probably just used slaves that he captured from the Spanish. We also know that he set about to establish a sugar plantation. It appears that his plantation was either in or near Cap Francais, on the northern coast of Saint-Dominique. That was a settlement we talked about last time, that village founded by Pierre Lelong and his crew. He and his wife Anne were two of the most prominent citizens in the town, perhaps even the most prominent. But the arrival of a buccaneer as famous as Lorho de Graff suggests that Cap Francais was already a promising settlement and growing quickly. De Graff may have been the very first sugar plantation in the region, at least if he wasn't the first, he was among the first. It's also likely that if André Zun did settle down after his arrest and release, he chose to settle down there in Cap Francais. It was sort of a boom town. Plantations were quickly becoming far more profitable than privateering, and the government was actively encouraging them. So I can imagine André Zun finding a wife of his own, and perhaps even starting a family. Anne and Pierre Lelong, if you will, the mayor and his wife, well, they would certainly have welcomed the two famous privateers to Cap Francais. Remember that Pierre was himself a former privateer, and, I mean, he probably even knew the two. They all fought in the Franco-Dutch War, and they may have even conducted raids together, and they lived nearby each other for a decade or more before any of them settled down in Cap Francais. I can picture Anne and Pierre Lelong inviting over de Graff and his wife and André Zun and his wife, if he had one, for dinner. Imagine the greatest corsair of the age, Lorho de Graff, probably born in a Dutch colony, although possibly Spanish, with his Spanish wife from the Canary Islands. Sitting next to him would be Mikhail André Zun, a Dutchman, and if he had a wife, she probably would have been someone he met in a brothel. And then the privateer, Pierre Lelong, who was French, with a wife that he too met in a brothel, who was a native of Brittany. Did Francesca de Guzman practice Catholicism? She was Spanish, after all. Did Anne and Pierre, who were both of them French? King Louis had decreed that everyone in his colonies must be Catholic, but we can assume that de Graff and André Zun weren't exactly good Catholics, right? 
Their names suggest that they were Dutch in origin, so they were probably Protestant, or they might have adhered to that old Dutch proverb, God is good, but gold is greater. All of these people are misfits in some form or another. They're criminals and prostitutes and exiles and religious minorities, and here they were. Now, I'm imagining them here, but they were the most prominent citizens in the most promising colony in the West Indies. This colony was soon to be called the Paris of the West Indies. It was the jewel of France's empire. And if they were at this dinner, they would have been served rich and exotic food by probably black and Indian Haitian slaves who likely practiced a very early form of voodoo. Honestly, if that happened, I couldn't paint a clearer picture of colonial America if I tried. I can picture those three couples starting their lives and sharing news and passing pleasant months together. The men might occasionally retire to smoke pipes and share war stories. The women, well, somehow I imagine three women with their rough pasts wouldn't be the sort to sit around knitting and sharing makeup tips. They probably enjoyed pipes of their own, along with a bottle of rum. But these three groups of people would have settled in to build a life, possibly to build families. Now, now most of that is pure speculation, but we do know that sometime in the following months, Anne and Pierre had some success on the family front. Anne became pregnant and chose to leave Saint-Dominique and return to Brittany. It was a far safer and cleaner environment to have a child than a frontier settlement in the West Indies. There were a lot more properly trained physicians, and a lot fewer mosquitoes. Exactly why Michel de Grammont didn't join de Graff and André Zune in Cap Francais, though, well, we don't know that. There may have been bad blood there after Campeche. After all, de Graff had kept him from executing those prisoners and fulfilling his promise to the Spanish governor. But there's also a very real possibility that he was gay, marrying and starting a family might not have been what he wanted. And that would actually make some sense. Remember that he was Chevalier, Sieur de Grammont. He had a promising future once. He was a man with titles back in France, but something prevented him from living that life. The story goes that he killed a man in a duel over his sister's honor, but that's exactly the type of story that a prominent father might pass around to explain his son's sudden disappearance and to insulate the family from shame. Perhaps, though, he just found a life of buying land and owning human beings distasteful. Or maybe he was the sort of person that wasn't comfortable in one place. Maybe he didn't care to put down roots. Maybe the sea called out to him. Maybe his veins ran with salt water, and maybe he had a bit of larceny in his blood. Whatever the case, though, he and Pierre Boat, and also a sloop with an unnamed captain, continued to rove. Instead of returning to Petit Guave and civilization, they chose instead to careen their ships on Roatan, and then to set up a base of operations there in the Bay of Honduras. Now, it wasn't just those three in the Bay of Honduras. There were more than a few other fugitives that made the bay their home. But those three operated out of the Bay of Honduras for a few months. However, by early 1686, all three vessels were spotted in the Leeward Islands, making their way north. It turns out they were headed for Charlestown, a new Providence Island. Now, they knew that Charlestown had been destroyed in a Spanish attack two years earlier. But the natural defenses of Charlestown Harbor and, frankly, the difficulty in getting there still made it an attractive place to lay anchor. Plus, there were still survivors in the ruins of Charlestown, people who didn't really have anywhere else to go, but certainly held some very bad blood against the Spanish. They would have made fine recruits. Elsewhere, the Spanish were busy doing some recruiting of their own. Back in Cadiz, they were marshalling their entire naval might for what was clearly an upcoming war. In all of their colonial holdings, especially those in the West Indies, they had empowered their governors and their viceroys to issue letters of reprisal against any nation suspected of harboring corsairs. That meant, in particular, the French. Now, Dutch and Spanish sailors primarily turned out to accept these letters of reprisal, but they turned out in droves. 
anyone who had been affected by the attentions of the English and the French and the Dutch, all of them privateers, well, they jumped at the chance. Every adventure-minded young man, anyone who was looking to earn a quick fortune, and every person that had lost parents or siblings or children, they all wanted a chance at revenge. Mercenary navies that looked very much like those that would coalesce under de Graaf or Henry Morgan, well, they started showing up all across the Spanish Empire. The difference here was that those private naval units didn't have that same code of rights and freedoms that the buccaneers had. Instead, they operated much more like a military. They were organized and regimented and focused. Most notably, units cropped up in the Bay of Biscay, which were some of the best soldiers in Spain, and also a large group in Santo Domingo, very close by Petit Guave. They were two terrifyingly strong and devoted groups of Spanish privateers, and they began to outfit their ships. But in Campeche, Cartagena, and Havana, they were engaging in a different sort of recruiting. Those privateers who had been taken in the battle at Alacran Reef well, they were being subjected to the attentions and the torments of the Spanish Inquisition. The Inquisitors there wanted information, and they would get it, but any average torturer could wrest a confession and get intelligence out of someone. Hot irons and blades and pincers just had that effect. But the Inquisitors here were masters at their craft. They could use a very real fear of God, who, remember, you were terrified you might be meeting very soon, to influence the minds of their prisoners. They were singularly skilled in turning their prisoners toward the light of God and the Catholic Spanish way of thinking. They were busy convincing many of those captured pirates to repent their sins and to enter into the service of the King of Spain, but they weren't trying to recruit more privateers. They were creating spies. They wanted men who could infiltrate the pirate havens without suspicion. Remember that letter I quoted earlier from Governor de Cusay to the Spanish governor at Santo Domingo and the reply that the Spanish governor wrote? That reply arrived in late January 1686. It was written by the governor, Mastre de Campo Andres de Robles. I'll read his reply one more time. Quote, Those with whom you should make this demonstration, and he means arrest, are Captain Gramont and Lorencio who are the ones who most infest these seas and lands of the king my lord. End quote. Andre de Robles was saying something in the subtext here. These two pirates are the men you should have arrested. If you refuse to make a demonstration of them, I will have to do so. And he would. In the West Indies, Spain was making moves against the pirates on a larger, worldwide, geopolitical level, they were making moves in a continuation of that war that had never really ended. Spain, right now, was against everyone, really. They considered all of the territory held by anyone in the New World, besides either Spain or Portugal, to be an affront to God's will. Remember the Treaty of Tordesillas from 1494? That was the treaty, which was endorsed by the Pope, that divided all of the lands outside Europe between the Portuguese Empire and the Crown of Castile. Now, it was obviously out of date. It was ridiculous, and frankly, it was laughable. But to the Spanish, it still had a certain emotional weight. It didn't really hold any legal precedence anymore, but the Spanish still believed it in their hearts. And frankly, that's why there was no peace beyond the line. And it's worth mentioning that Maestre de Robles currently held an office that had first been held by Christopher Columbus. The island of Hispaniola, Santo Domingo, was the site of Spain's first New World colony, and in fact, the very site on which Cap Francais sat, the Cape there, was where the very first Spanish settlement in the New World, La Navidad, existed. It was, to the Spanish, almost a personal affront that there were Frenchmen there. So they intended to take back their land, and they were going to do so by exterminating the Corsair menace. They would begin with Lorencio. Maestro Robles letter, that reply, was sent via a small Spanish fleet. The fleet was carrying several hundred soldiers, and those soldiers landed 
at the plantation of Lorho de Graaf. Now, we don't have an accurate record of this event. The Spanish rarely kept the same sorts of records on their own invasions as they did when somebody else invaded, and even if they did have them, it didn't make good political sense to release them. If we assume that my assertions earlier were correct, those about de Graaf and André Zun settling down in Cap Francais, which we shouldn't do, I don't have a record saying that's the case. Maybe somewhere in the Haitian records there's a deed to the de Graaf plantation disputing me here, but it makes sense that his plantation would be there. It was the largest, fastest-growing new settlement on Saint-Dominique, and it was in territory that Spain still technically held. If that is the case, when Spain landed to deal with Laurencio, they would have landed at Cap Francais. It was a French settlement on their land in what had once been their first colony in the New World, and it was home to two of the most dangerous pirates ever to sail. De Graaf was there, probably with his wife. André Zun would have been there as well, possibly, if he had one, with his wife. Pierre Lelong was there as well, but Anne was safely back in Brittany. What we know from a record after the event is that a small Spanish force landed near the de Graaf plantation and left with 100 of his slaves, and that's all we know for certain. But do you imagine that a Spanish invasion force in a French settlement would stop at collecting some slaves from one of what they considered, quote, the ones who most infest these seas and lands of the king? No, it was an attack. It was a raid. In a lot of ways, it was very much like every raid on a coastal Spanish settlement that these pirates had committed. The Spanish were there to visit upon them everything that they had brought upon the Spanish. They were there to ransack, to burn, to rape and murder and steal. This was an act of revenge. And from the point of view of many Spanish people, it may have been justice. But these weren't Spanish army regulars in the Cap Francais, they would have had better discipline. These forces, there to attack the de Graaf plantation, were those privateers. Now this wasn't the first time, and it wouldn't be the last, that Spain had turned to the aid of sea rovers during one of their wars. What distinguished these Spanish privateers, though, from their English and French counterparts, was their willingness to attack where and when they were told. Now, it's possible that the English and French were just better at hiding their own involvement in the affairs of the pirates, but we know that Spain did order this strike on Lord de Graaf's plantation. I also notice here that, at this point, the record of Mikhail Andrezun ends. Shortly before this attack is the last mention we ever get of him in the historical record. He was one of the most notorious pirates of the buccaneer age, and he just disappears. Francesca Petronilla de Guzman, well, she won't be mentioned in any records ever again, while her husband, Lorjo de Graaf, well, he most certainly will be. These Spanish privateers, I would argue, entered into the township at Cap Francais, where they attacked with all of their might. Now, most of the men there were former buccaneers, so they knew how to handle themselves in a fight. They probably mounted a defense as well as they could but the Spanish used the same strategy that had served these pirates so well in the past. They surprised them, they overwhelmed them immediately, and then they defeated them. In the fighting and the pillaging that followed, I think Mikhail Andrezun was killed. I think de Graaf lost his wife, Francesca. Considering that she was the wife of Lorenzo himself, we can be reasonably sure that she was lucky if she experienced a quick death. Perhaps she had the opportunity to take her own life before the Spanish got to her. And I think as well that Pierre Lelong was killed here. However, in this case there is some evidence that he actually survived the attack. The only records I have of Pierre Lelong only mention him once after this event, when he dies during a fight with a Spaniard from Santo Domingo. Now that fight happens, according to the record, more than a year after this raid. But it's possible that he actually died here in this raid on Cap Francais. The record comes from France, not Saint-Dominique, so it would have been recorded when his wife, Anne, learned the news of his death. Their daughter, Marie Marguerite Yvonne Lelong, would have been only a few months old. If all that did in fact happen as I have theorized, and 
Again, we don't know that it did. It appears that Michel de Grammont may have been right when he made the choice to not settle down in Cap Francais. Instead, he was busy preparing for a raid against the Spanish in St. Augustine. Someday I'd really like to do a special on St. Augustine. Much like Campeche, it has a history that perfectly encapsulates both the colonial struggle of the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries and also portrays the role that pirates played in building that world. But I won't go into detail now. In short, though, it had for over a hundred years been a constant source of Spanish aggression and a target of French and English raiding. Most recently, St. Augustine had attacked Charlestown in the Carolina colony and been repelled. Then they attacked Charlestown in New Providence and virtually destroyed it. That's why Grammont was there in the first place. He was using it as a base to recruit and prepare his attack against St. Augustine. Now, he was there with Nicholas Bragau and another unnamed sloop. Their plan was almost ready, but they needed some intelligence before they attacked. Bragau agreed to sail for Matanzas, which was an inlet near San Augustine. Matanzas was once the site of a shipwreck of French settlers near San Augustine. When they wrecked, the Spanish sent out their soldiers and killed every last one of the French. Then they named it Matanzas, which in Spanish means slaughter. Bragau hoisted Spanish colors before departing, an attempt to fool the Spanish, and then set sail. Grammont waited for him just down the coast, but after three days, Bragau didn't return. Now, you've seen horror movies. If you are in the abandoned cabin in the middle of the woods and your friend in the basement suddenly goes quiet, is it ever a good idea to follow them? In the movies, no, no it's not, but they always go anyway. However, in real life, the most likely explanation is that they had an accident. Maybe they hit their head, and it would be irresponsible not to go and check on them. But if the best-case scenario is a dangerous accident and the worst-case scenario is Jason Voorhees, you should be extremely careful. Now, in this convoluted analogy, Spain would be Jason Voorhees. Now, I'm not trying to impugn the Spanish, despite the mass slaughter of innocent civilians at this very location, but in this case, it wasn't Jason. It wasn't the Spanish that got Bragau. When Grammont went to check on him, it was clear that it was a less malicious but equally dangerous force that claimed him. It was a storm, and a bad one. It was clear that Bragau had been sunk in his smaller vessel. When Grammont caught up to the vessel, he got caught up in that same storm. But he was better equipped to ride it out. The St. Nicholas, his ship, was seaworthy and able to weather that storm, but still it was forced north. He never got to raid St. Augustine. He would eventually touch down at Carolina, near Charlestown. Unfortunately, though, he wouldn't be welcomed in there. The English had a no-tolerance policy towards pirates in those days, and the dockmen in Charlestown were less inclined to look the other way than those in Port Royal. So Grimal realized he was quickly running out of options, Petit Gua was no longer welcoming. The West Indies as a whole were becoming more and more dangerous. The English colonies up in North America wouldn't have him, and he certainly couldn't go back to Europe. This was a problem that was staring every pirate in the West Indies, every privateer and buccaneer. It was staring them in the face. The world was moving on, and they just weren't welcome anymore. So Michel de Grammont turned to the same solution that Jean Hamelin had, the same solution that more and more of his brethren were electing to choose, the same that nearly all of the pirates in the world would soon choose. He sailed east. There were already rovers off the coast of Africa dealing in slaves and gold and ivory, but they were getting more and more organized. The west coast of Africa had opportunities for slaving work, but over on the east coast, those waters were rich. They were filled with ships from Egypt, from the Ottoman Empire, and from the Mughal Empire. But it's here, when he sails across the Atlantic, that we lose touch with Michel de Grammont. We don't know what he got up to when he sailed east. There were some rumors surrounding ships that went missing, claiming Michel de Grammont was behind it, but there's very little proof. You see, over in the east, that was a different world. In the West Indies, he was famous, he was notorious, but over there his name held no weight. 
If he did, in fact, run into English shipping or Mughal shipping, well, recording his fate probably wouldn't be worth the ink it took to write it down. In fact, the only people who cared to remember his name were the other buccaneers. It was one of those who reported to Pierre-Paul de Cousset over a year later, quote, Sieur de Gramont has perished with approximately 180 men that were aboard his ship, end quote. And that seems like a suitable place to end. The loss of Michel de Grammont and the presumable loss of Mikhail Andrézoun, well, that marked the practical end of piracy in the West Indies. For now. It's a dangerous game to try and define the end of an age. There are good questions to be asked about what even constitutes an age and what definitions one might use to define its end. Most self-respecting historians would avoid even approaching such questionable ideas and all of the pitfalls they might hold, but I'm more willing to do so. The end of the buccaneering era wasn't an explosive moment. It was a slow process. Really, ever since Henry Morgan's raid on Panama, the buccaneers have been in decline. Now, the English successfully mitigated Morgan's threat by knighting him and giving him power in Jamaican politics. They made him respectable. After that happened, the Brethren of the Coast lost their figurehead. They didn't have someone they could rally around. But then those French and Dutch buccaneers rose to prominence during the Franco-Dutch War. It revitalized the Brethren of the Coast. So many of their old haunts became useful again, and it gave them a new life. They could, and often did, rally around either de Graaf or Grimaud. But now, both of them have, in very different ways, been neutralized. Grimaud was dead. De Graaf's life had been torn apart, and before long he was going to suffer the same fate as Morgan. Now that's not to say that there weren't any pirates left in the West Indies. There were. There are always pirates in the West Indies. But none of them were successful. Most of them just ended their days in obscurity at the end of a rope. The pirates that remained in the world, and there were many of them, well, they fled. They looked for more profitable and hospitable hunting grounds. They spread far and wide. They went to Madagascar and the Red Sea, from the Indian Ocean to the deep East Indies, from the coasts of Australia to the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean. For now, though, piracy in the Caribbean was a memory. But the stories of those who were left behind aren't over. Jan Willems was still alive, and he will return. He's been hiding out in the swamps of Carolina this whole time. Lorho de Graff was still alive. Presumably, he buried his wife and sifted through the ashes of his plantation. But he would return to Petit Guave to begin anew. Anne was a new mother, and she was safe there in Brittany. But her husband, Pierre Lelong, was dead, or at least he soon would be. For those three, for Anne, Lorho de Graff, and Jan Willems, all that was left for them right now would be to begin picking up the pieces of their lives. However, the lives of all three are about to be swept up in a maelstrom of global war.